Dear friends, IAGS brings to you the recordings of recent Indo-UK Surgicon, which was jointly organized with Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. This is an enormous source of information from some of the best in the world in different specialities. So this week, we are dealing with hernia, and we hope that you, you enjoy the content. On Friday, we will also hear from our founding president, Professor Odwadia, about his journey, surgical journey. So please log in every day, 6 p.m., to hear some of the best in hernia this week. And next week will be another speciality. Please feel free to give your questions. And every week, the convener of the week will be happy to answer them. All the best to you. So, uh, as a coordinator for this session, I welcome all of you on behalf of Indo UK Surgicon. It's my proud privilege to introduce the first three names who are going to be the chairpersons for the next one hour. And they will be introducing the speakers. And they are very good friends as well as my mentors, Dr. Sandeep Dave from Raipur, Dr. Pramod Shinde from Nasik, and Dr. Padma Kumar from Koti. So I am handing over this session to uh, three of you, and I'm sure uh, this, this will go a great deal because we have got excellent speakers for the next one hour. I'm all here, all ears and eyes watching this show. Over to you, chairpersons. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, friends. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. So I'll uh, invite, first of all, my best friend, Dr. Ramesh Agrawala from Kolkata who is chairperson, uh, chairman as well as uh, the director of uh, Fortis Hair Care in Kolkata. And he'll be talking on avoiding injuries in minimal access hernia surgeries. Over to you, Ramesh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandeep. Uh, can I share my slides? Share my, share my screen? Yes, sir. Please, yes, sir. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. Yeah. Please, slides also. Yes. yes. So, uh, I bring greetings from Calcutta and Fortis Hospital. Uh, thank you very much, respected chairpersons, uh, fellow delegates. I would like to thank the Indo-UK organizing team for giving me this privilege to talk about avoiding injuries in hernia surgeries. So, many of the videos have been contributed by my colleagues and I acknowledge their contribution. To avoid injuries, you have to be aware of these injuries, what injuries can occur and you should have knowledge of them. And you need skills and experience to avoid these injuries, which is very important. So, we look at how do we avoid. One is preoperative planning, which is very important. Another is how you do it intraoperative. So we will divide this talk into two parts. One is ventral hernia, another is groin hernias, because the subject is mass hernia. So first, most important is patient selection. So you should consider your own experience. If you are a beginner, you should start with less complex cases. Always remember prior hernia repairs, large defect sizes, incarcerated hernias, increase the difficulty and duration of the procedure. And if you are new, these are not the cases to start with. And also consider the resources which are available at your institution. So this preoperative uh, homework has to be done very well. Now access, 50% of the complications of laparoscopic surgery happen at the end of the axis. So the initial abdominal axis in ventral hernia should be as far away from the defect and prior laparotomy incisions as possible. The ideal location is left or right upper quadrant, but it can be modif modified according to patient's surgical history and anatomy. You can use any method, varies open, optical, and it depends on your experience and your outcomes and how comfortable you are with the technique, together with the patient's surgically, surgical history and anatomy. So here you see this 
is an axis where the troker has gone into the stomach. The axis was through the palmer's point. The only mistake which was done was the the rice tube was not put in. So whenever you have this palmer axis, you have to remember that you have to put in a rice tube and you have to uh, uh, palpate for the spleen. Now, this is OptiView. So few of us believe that if you have OptiView, then you will not have injuries. But here you see OptiView also can cause injuries. So it is not the method, but you know it's also your that day in, but you have to do all the, you have to choose a method which you are very, very comfortable with. Now, when you go in, you might have bubble additions, which you see on the screen. So it is very important that you do sharp edisolysis without any diatomy. Avoid uses of energy sources. And you should dissect above the peritoneum of the sheath. Please do not try to dissect between the bowel and the peritoneum. And if you find difficulty, you can always make a small incision, take out the bowel, do an open edisolysis, which is known as the hybrid procedure. So if you have a look at this video, you see the bowel is totally plastered to the anterior abdominal wall. And what we are cutting is above, one plane above. So you are not trying to get a plane between the bowel and the peritoneum, but you are taking a part of the sheath, which is very important. And you are doing with sharp scissors. You are not using any diatomy sources. So this is very, very important. And when we do ventral hernia surgery, all of us are going to come for bowel additions. After you've done that, you should always check whether it is all right. Now, in this video, you can see the surgeon is not going in that exact plane. He's trying to dissect between the bowel and the peritoneum, and there is an introtomy. So if you have an introtomy, always close the introtomy before proceeding forwards. If you can do it laparoscopically, you do it laparoscopically. If you cannot do it laparoscopically, you should do a small laparotomy and continue. Now you might have irreducible obstructed hernias. So if you want to carry on laparoscopically, the first thing is increase the hernial opening. And when you give traction, it should be very gentle because if you are dealing with bowel, the bowel walls are edematous and you might cause iatrogenic injury. And you should ask your assistant or you yourself can give some external pressure. And again, if you are in doubt, it's, it, you can always make a small incision, take out the bowel, reduce, and then close the uh, gap and carry on with your laparoscopic repair, which again is a hybrid, uh, hybrid procedure. So here you can see that you have to be very gentle again because the bowel is very near. You are using scissors. And here you have to be very, very gentle. You can see the bowel is dilated, edematous, and you have to be very, very gentle to bring down this bowel. But if you do not do that, so here you see the surgeon, in spite of increasing the incision, he was in a bit of hurry and he put a lot of pressure. So when you put a lot of pressure and you, when you don't want to convert, then this is what happens is you can see there is an iatrogenic perforation. So we don't want something like this. Now, what happens that whenever we are tacking, sometimes we have bleeding. So you should have be aware of the anatomy of the abdominal, the abdominal wall, blood vessels, and you can transilvanate to see the vessels before tacking. So you can see, you, you, you can uh, sort of uh, put the OT lights off and you have your telescope light and you can map the vessels on a distended abdomen. So when you are tacking the mesh, so you can avoid these vessels. So this is the only way you can prevent these bleedings because if there is bleeding, though you may be able to control it, but you know, it takes a lot of your time. So we don't want bleeding as such, you see, though these bleedings can be controlled by pressure. So there is no entry to tackers. In groin hernias, again, preoperative, you need patient selection. Consider your experience. Initially start with less complex cases. Prior hernia repairs, large immunoscrotal hernias, Incarcerated hernias increase the difficulty and duration of the procedure. Consider the resources available at your institution. So if you want to do a TEP, the ideal patient would be a thin-built elderly male, direct 
right direct incomplete reducible hernias and distance between the umbilicus and the symphysis pubis this must be greater than 15 cm no previous surgery no significant comorbidities so most of these injuries are dissection related injuries so you can have blood vessel injuries which will be iliac inferior pregastric or spermatic you may have nerves you may have urinary bladder you may have vas and the cause is poor knowledge of anatomy not recognizing the structures wrong use of energy sources impatience lack of skills so here you see we are all aware of this triangle of doom and we know the boundaries of doom so it is very important that you do not bear the blood vessels there in this triangle of doom avoid energy sources which is very important now this is the case of recurrent brain hernia and which was after the open reef stopa repair and here you see uh, the planes are not this is not a idea this is what you call is a improper case selection so this is not a case where you need to go laparoscopically and here uh, the surgeon is using that uh, this harmonic scalpel and we are just coating for disaster so what you see is this is the iliac so the iliac has gone so you have to choose your patient very well now you have this ben david circle so you should be aware of this anatomy so if you are aware of this anatomy you will not use energy sources at that area and you will be very very cautious while dissecting but if you are not aware of the anatomy you will land up in problem in this area now inferior epigastric artery you need to identify initially keep it on the roof and dissect below which is very important but sometimes when you are dissecting the inferior epigastric hangs so you have to be very very careful and you have to be careful while you are trying to dissect the inferior epigastric and take it on the roof you might have a incident like this where you have nicked the inferior epigastric and we don't want a situation like this if it happens you have to suture or use a bipolar which is important now you can see this is the right inguinal nerve you can see the nerves we know the triangle of pain which is there where you have this lateral cutaneous nerve tie and the other nerves are there so it is very very important that when you do lateral dissection do not try to demonstrate the nerves below the iliopubic tract do not remove the fatty tissue over the nerves no energy sources in that area which is very important and when you are fixing the mesh you should see that there is no fixation of the mesh below the iliopubic tract in the picture you can see there is a tacker which is given below the iliopubic tract now it is very important as uh, to be safe you have to have the knowledge of anatomy so the medial umbilical ligament the medial umbilical ligament we know that you should never go me medial to the medial umbilical ligament or you are going to cause disaster here a senior surgeon very confident you can see he is going with sharp dissections and he is going to the medial to the medial umbilical ligament and see what happens when you do not respect the anatomy and the guideline you are in the urinary bladder so that is a problem then again this patient had a previous pelvic surgery which is one of the contraindications for a laparoscopic repair but here you see what happens everything is so adhered so you can see this is a big hernia the dissection has been done and here you know this is the medial dissection you are trying to do and you are doing it you are not using any energy sources or any sharp dissection you you are just using a gauze piece and you see in spite of this because it was adhered the bladder is given away so anything can happen you see so this this is a bladder injury which has happened and you can see the uh, bulb of the foley's catheter inside so this can happen the vas you should no touch technique try not to handle the vas if you have to have a uh, gentle correct dissection and preserve the spermatic fascia which is very important so avoiding injuries prevention is better than cure we cure we have always known this have sound knowledge of anatomy which is very very important acquire skills and training and that's the only way you can avoid injuries thank you very much hello yeah thank you ramesh and as usual 
it was a nice and crisp presentation on how to avoid injuries uh, during hernia surgery if anybody has got any question how to go ahead i do hello hello yes in the chat box there are no questions there so i think nobody has come back from lunch and the opening batsman people must be having lunch i think So that, maybe, that, maybe, maybe. That's the problem of being the opening batsman, and I time my presentation, you know, so that I have finished it right at twelve. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, to, maybe to, I could ask you a question. As yes, to, you can ask. Yes. Yeah. yeah. How much does the learning curve affect the injuries in an MAS hernia repair? you think that injuries are more common during the learning curve or they are in fact when the surgeon becomes very accomplished and becomes a little more bold yes see it is all about your attitude so uh, what happens when you become very complacent then you are in for trouble so that is the whole problem so uh, we have seen people when they become very complacent and they very accomplished they do more injuries and more grievous injuries so during the learning period definitely you are going to have injuries but they also happen once you are accomplished so one has to be very hum humble and grounded which is very important then that is the only way you can avoid injuries can you keep on learning because every day you keep on learning so you pick up tricks and this transillumination trick was picked up by me in one of the webinars and uh, so you know keep you keep up learning things and you should have the hunger to learn and you can never say that i have no enough so that's the only way i think is uh, to avoid but in spite of that you're going to have but your incidence of injuries will be less and uh, i personally feel that sticking to the anatomy and sticking to the rules and basics of the surgery is also very very important while you are performing hernia surgery especially inguinal because it's a new area for a learner beginner So I think there has to be a lot of hand holding there. Yeah, we can move to the next promo. Yes, yes, yes. Let's move on to the next speaker. Okay, thank you. Doctor Padma Kumar is there. I think you can introduce. Deepraj. Yes. So no, with my uh, if Doctor Padma Kumar is not there, it will be my great honor and pleasure. to introduce a close friend of mine one of the towering personalities of uh, minimal access surgery and iages dr deepraj bandarkar who is a consultant minimal access and robotic surgeon at the pdg induja hospital in mumbai and we know that he has led many movements in iages and especially notably the the journal that that we all have been very proud of the jmas and he has also conducted a very unique conference on sills and uh, i would invite dr dipraj bhandarkar for his next talk on reducing surgical site occurrences in mas hernia surgery there is my uh, screen visible yes sir okay uh good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh thank you pramod for that uh, kind introduction and uh, i will be restricting my talk to reducing surgical site occurrences in uh, ms in ventral hernia surgery but several of the principles that apply to ventral hernia surgery are also applicable in uh, the inguinal hernia field i have no disclosures as far as this uh, presentation is concerned and the agenda that we're going to cover is first of all look at the definition of surgical site occurrences talk a little bit about sso in the context of ms ventral hernia surgery next we look at whether it's possible to predict or in some way foresee the ssos and then strategies in reducing uh, the surgical site occurrences and today the field of the laparoscopic ventral hernia repair has expanded from ipom to retromuscular endoscopic approaches as well as subcutaneous approaches but most of the presentation here again will be focused on the ipom technique 
because there's not too much uh, data in terms of uh, any of these in the retromuscular or subcutaneous approaches, particularly when it comes to reducing the uh, SSO. So the surgical site occurrence was a term coined by the ventral hernia working group about 10 years ago. And it encompasses all the events or the wound events that can happen in the post-operative period. This, is, this has been studied extensively in the context of the open ventral hernia repair. There are hardly any data uh, worth mentioning when it comes to the minimal access surgery part of it. So on the one hand, you have the infection, which could be cellulitis or the surgical site infection, which gets divided into the superficial deep and the organ space infection. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have the sterile fluid, fluid collection. And uh, enterocutaneous uh, fistulas. There have been several studies and reports which say that the minimal access surgery, ventral hernia repair, and also the inguinal hernia repair, by and large reduces the incidence of the surgical site occurrences. So that, that's a known fact. And this was the original classification proposed by the ventral hernia working group that in grade one, you have low risk uh, patients who are low risk to uh, develop an SSO. Grade two, patients with comorbidities. Grade three are the potentially contaminated fields and grade four are frankly infected fields. Now, when we restrict this talk to the MAS context, generally you would be approaching only the grade one and grade two patients with a minimal access approach and the grade three, grade four uh, would go out. There is only one paper which I could find, which was a retrospective study of 200 odd patients undertaken at, a, at two institutions over 10 years who had undergone laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. And using this uh, algorithm or using this grading system, they found that in the context of the laparoscopic ventral hernia repair, they could not really predict or uh, foresee the uh, surgical site infections or indeed the surgical site occurrences. So again, this term, as I mentioned right in the beginning, is more uh, to do with the open ventral hernia repairs rather than the minimal access uh, repairs. Let us now look at some of the strategies to avoid the surgical site infections. And this would equally apply to the lap laparoscopic inguinal hernia field also. So preoperative optimization, some adjuncts, a focus on the surgical technique, choice of the mesh and handling of the mesh, instrument sterilization and avoiding reuse of single-use devices. So in the context of ventral hernia, it is very important to get the patient to smoke, stop smoking at least for about two, preferably uh, a little longer, more than two weeks. The obesity is a factor and diabetes needs to be well controlled. Let us now look at the role of some of the adjuncts. If you look at the overall meta-analysis in terms of comparing chlorhexidine as a skin preparation to the povidone iodine, which we commonly use, it has clearly been shown in this meta-analysis, which appeared in British Journal of Surgery about four years ago, that chlorhexidine is superior to the povidone iodine skin preparation. However, Professor Michael Rosen's group presented and uh, put forward this paper which suggested that in the context of open ventral hernia, the chlorhexidine may be slightly inferior and that may in fact increase the risk of surgical site infections. There are no data available as far as uh, minimal access ventral hernia surgery is concerned, but it is safe to say that chlor using chlorhexidine and alcohol-based skin prep is probably the optimal way of uh, doing it. Antibiotics. We assume that these cases are clean cases and a single shot of uh, first generation cephalosporin should be enough. Plastic drapes uh, on the skin do not really uh, have any effect on reducing the surgical site infections uh, as far as ventral hernia repair is concerned. In surgical technique, avoiding an entrotomy or even a micro entrotomy when there are dense bowel adhesions to the anterior abdominal wall or perhaps a previously placed mesh 
is of the essence because this significantly increases the surgical site complications in the first month. Second approach is in terms of reducing the seroma. This was a trial which was a randomized trial of uh, a purely laparoscopic versus a hybrid approach. And if you this uh, now they have recently published the one year follow up of this uh, particular paper. And if you use a hybrid approach to excise the skin and the redundant sac, particularly in uh, hernias which have a small defect, so they are amenable to a minimal access approach, but at the same time have a redundant uh, sac and redundant skin, the hybrid approach certainly reduces the seroma. When it comes to choice of the mesh, I don't think there's anything in the literature on which mesh is superior, but it has been well studied that for an IPOM, a coated mesh is what needs to be used. And a medium weight polypropylene is the mesh of choice for most endoscopic retromuscular as well as uh, uh, subcutaneous only approaches like the SCOLA. And if there is any uh, risk of contamination in terms of either an accidental entrotomy during the surgery or when one is performing an uh, emergency surgery for a ventral hernia or uh, an inguinal hernia, it's best to avoid using the mesh uh, as far as possible. Handling of the mesh is very crucial. I think as surgeons, we take the mesh very lightly. And I think here I feel that we need to take a leaf out of the book of the orthopedic surgeons and see the way they handle their implants the knee implants, the hip implants, any implant that go into the patient are handled with such care. So I think the mesh being an implant deserves the same attention and the same care. So principles such as changing the gloves before handling the mesh, taking the mesh on the trolley as late as possible just prior to it being used, placing a sterile tray while taking corner sutures or while soaking it in saline, some of the composite meshes, they need to be hydrated in uh, saline. Inserting the mesh through a port without any contact with the skin and retrieving the corner sutures by an inside out method with the help of a suture passer rather than the outside in method where you could be driving the skin bacteria across the mesh. So these are the basic principles, tenets of handling a mesh in ventral hernia surgery. And these are also valid for the inguinal hernia. The one thing that should never ever be done is to use the mesh, place the mesh on the skin and use it as a template for marking the uh, points of retrieval of the uh, corner sutures. Needless to say that sterilization is very important and crucial as far as all minimal access surgery goes, but particularly so when it comes to hernia surgery. And all hand instruments should be either autoclave, uh, sterilized by an ETO, or should be used, uh, sterilized using a sterat. This was a paper which was published long time ago on the reuse of uh, reprocessing of single use devices, and it clearly shows that you cannot clean the instruments adequately. So the instruments were percent of the uh, instruments had some blood residue. 54 percent of the instruments were faulty in some respect in terms of their functionality. And in 40 percent, the instrument sterilization was ineffective. So as far as possible, when it comes to hernia surgery, one should not really be using uh, single use devices repeatedly. The next is the strategies for reducing the seroma, the practice of the IPOM plus or closing the defect and then placing a mesh over it has been shown to be uh, effective in reducing the seroma in this meta analysis, which was uh, published in the British Journal of Surgery two years ago. Again, the only caveat here is that this was a meta analysis looking at non-randomized trials because when this meta-analysis was published there were no randomized trials comparing uh, defect closure with uh, uh, an IPOM uh, alone and this is another method which has been shown recently a small series that if you 
cauterize the hernia sac in laparoscopic ventral hernia repair it tends to reduce the post operative seroma similar maneuvers such as uh, pulling the pseudo sac or the lax transversalis fascia in a direct inguinal hernia and either fixing it to the cooper's ligament or to the back of the rectus muscle have been shown to reduce the incidence of seroma in laparoscopic inguinal hernia repairs so to conclude it is in the context of ventral hernia it's important to use some form of risk stratification preoperatively optimize the patient's comorbidities use a meticulous technique and avoid enterotomies at all costs obsessive attention to sterilization is a must and defect closures have an effect of reducing the incidence of uh, seromas thank you very much for your attention thank you deepraj for a wonderful talk as usual uh, i do not see any questions in the chat box but i would like to ask something somebody is uh, asked this... telescope sterilization packer sterilization do you want me to answer that we have already yeah, yeah. discussed that as far as possible you should not be really uh, using uh, uh, we sterilized instruments telescope sterilization so telescope many of the uh new models telescopes are actually autoclavable but we always shy away from autoclaving them so it's fine to place the telescope in a high level disinfectant like uh, neutraldehyde or alpharaldehyde the logic is that when it is dipped in this disinfectant the disinfectant reaches each and every corner of that uh, telescope and the telescope can be adequately uh, sterilized when it comes to hand instruments these are not ideal ways tackers as far as possible avoid sterilization but if you need to then it should be either eto or reprocessed using sterat yeah sorry pramod you were saying ah uh, well i wanted to ask you that it's my observation that we do not have any formal method of risk stratification in general if i look if you look at surgeons so do you think an app like the cedar app which was developed by the carolinas group yeah we start using it routinely it will help us in a better risk stratification and uh, predicting surgical uh, site occurrences outcomes and other uh, complications also yeah absolutely right so cedar app is is a useful app and in fact there is one study which compared the ability of the uh, ventral hernia Uh, a group score there is something called as a modified uh, ventral hernia group score and the uh, cedar rap so they compared these three modalities in their ability to predict the post operative events and they found that the modified ventral hernia group score was the one which stood out because that predicted the post operative events better than the cedar or or the uh, ventral hernia group score so yes but we need to particularly in the context of open ventral hernias i'm not too sure it it makes that much of a difference when it comes to the minimal access ventral hernia but in open ventral hernia surgery certainly it is uh, useful to use some kind of a stratification thank you thank you thank you nice answer so thank dr dawey ji you have any questions uh it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker okay fair enough fair enough i, I think dr anubhav vindal is our next speaker so okay. all of us agree he could speak to us on his next topic of hernia hybrid hernia repair and dr anubhav vindal is presently the professor of surgery and co-chairman of division of minimal access surgery at the very renowned and famous maulana azad medical college new delhi and he is been one of the uh, leaders in this hernia repair surgeries in ventral hernias and in minimal access surgeries he looks young but he is pretty uh, mature in his wide variety of experiences in many other minimal access surgeries and especially the ventral hernia surgeries so over to you dr anubhav vindal 
go straight to the last presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that very kind invitation. I'm just waiting for my slides to come up. Yes, they are on. We can see them. I would like to thank IAGS for giving me the opportunity to present at this very unique meeting. I bring you greetings from Malana's at Medical College, New Delhi. I'll be talking on hybrid repair for ventral and incisional hernia. We all know that incisional hernias are fairly common after laparotomy, with a reported incidence between 2 to 40 percent. Numerous methods of repairs have been described in literature. However, there has been no gold standard repair described till now. The types of repairs for incisional hernias can broadly be classified as open techniques and laparoscopic techniques. Each of these techniques have their own advantages and disadvantages. Open repairs have their advantages in the form that they are easy to, uh, easy to learn. They allow safe dissection and adhesion lysis. The mesh can be placed in several planes as an onlay, inlay, and sublay. There are less chance of adhesions between the mesh and the viscera as the mesh is away from the peritoneal cavity. In case there is a previous ugly scar, it can be excised, offering better cosmesis in the post-operative period to the patient. And overall open repairs are less costly compared to the laparoscopic repairs. However, these repairs also have their disadvantages in the form of higher rates of post-operative complications, higher rates of mesh-related reoperations, bigger incisions, more post-operative pain, and a longer convalescence and hospital stay. The laparoscopic repairs have the advantages in the form of minimal contact of the mesh with the patient's skin and therefore lesser chances of mesh-related infections, reduced post-operative ileus, less post-operative pain and therefore a faster recovery. However, the last laparoscopic repairs also have their own set of disadvantages. They are technically demanding. Uh, they have a higher chance of interoperative complications. They may leave remnant scars, especially in previous laparotomy cases, and therefore the post-operative cosmetic uh, results and patient satisfaction is lower compared to open repairs. And overall, laparoscopic repairs are costlier compared to the open counterparts. The hybrid repairs were devised in, uh, with a view to combine the advantages of the open and laparoscopic techniques so that the patient can get advantage of each of these two. They offer safe dissection and adhesion lysis under direct vision like open repairs. The mesh is placed inside the peritoneum like in laparoscopic repair. There is minimal tissue dissection and therefore less chance of post-operative infection like laparoscopic repairs. Large defects are also amenable to repair like in open repairs. Scars can be excised, therefore offering better cosmesis and improved patient satisfaction like in open repair. There are two approaches described for hybrid repair of incisional and mental hernias. The first approach is when the, the first part of the, the first component of the approach is laparoscopic approach, followed by opening of the sac, adhesion lysis, followed by laparoscopic mesh fixation. And the second approach is an initial open approach and adhesion lysis, followed by laparoscopic assisted mesh fixation. There have been numerous uh, papers published in literature reporting on hybrid ventral hernia repair. This paper published in 2009. Uh, from Greece reported on six patients with a facial defect between 116 to 190 centimeters square. The authors reported a uh, follow-up of 12 months where all the patients were asymptomatic with no incidence of recurrence. They concluded that this technique is safe in recurrent, complicated, or difficult incisional hernias. This paper published from USA reported on seven patients operated at a single paper, a single center and concluded that hybrid repair is an alternative approach to difficult ventral hernias that may require conversion to open and usual lysis or mesh exploitation. This paper published from Turkey in 2015 reported on 28 patients over a period of six years who were divided into two groups, 12 undergoing laparoscopic repairs and 16 undergoing hybrid repairs. On uh, on comparing the complications in the two groups, there was no significant difference found, and the only recurrence that was seen was in laparoscopic group. The authors therefore concluded that this approach is to be preferred in giant incisional hernias, where laparoscopic approach would not be convenient or feasible. This paper, published in 2015, uh, reported on uh, uh, patients operated between 2012 and 2015 in Poland, 15 patients in all, 
with 32 months of follow-up and the authors concluded that this technique is optimal and a safe solution for recurrent, complicated, large incisional and ventral hernias. This large series from Finland, published in 2018, reported on patients divided into two groups, 38 of whom were operated through the laparoscopic route and 24 by the hybrid route. The authors concluded that hybrid approach is associated with a lower risk of undetected entrotomy in patients with complex adhesions, and it should be considered the operative method of choice when adhesions are foreseeable. Another paper published in 2017 from Germany reported on seven patients with a median hernia size of 8 cm. The authors concluded that technique is simple, time-saving, and safe, and that it allows substantial reduction in post-operative pain compared to the open approach. This paper published from Russia reported on 18 patients with a follow-up ranging from 3 to 103 months. And uh, the authors found that hybrid repair is safe and effective procedure. However, they were of the opinion that further studies are necessary to assess the cost effectiveness of this procedure. The largest study uh, published till date on hybrid repair was from Finland published in 2019, reporting 193 patients divided into two groups of laparoscopic ventral hernia repair and hybrid ventral hernia repair. The authors reported their results at the end of one year of follow-up and reported that hybrid method eliminates bulging and decreases the seroma size and keeps the potential infection at, uh, risk low, thereby offering the same advantages of laparoscopic repair to these patients despite having complicated hernias. Another paper published in 2019 from India reported on 75 patients undergoing hybrid incisional hernia repair by two techniques. 65 patients underwent lab followed by open route and 10 uh, patients were operated by the open followed by lab route. The authors concluded at the end of 24 months of follow-up that the hybrid technique helps in safe reduction of hernia contents, offering safe adhesiolysis, decreasing defect size compared to the open repair and avoiding dissection of large flaps and placing a laparoscopic mesh. This recent uh, systematic review was published in September 2020 and reported on uh, all the studies in published literature between 2002 and 2019. A total of 218 articles were screened and 10 were selected for reporting. On, uh, on, on uh, comparing the complications, and collating the data, it was found that the overall complication rate using the hybrid hernia repair approach was low, and specifically the recurrence rate was range, uh, ranging between 0 to 6.3 percent, with an average recurrence rate of only 3.3 percent, which is a very, very uh, impressive statistic if we keep in mind the, that most of these hernias that were repaired by the hybrid route were complicated and large. The authors were of the opinion that hybrid repair is a promising technique for complex and difficult ventral incisional hernias, and that this technique represents a natural evolution in advancement of hernia repair beyond simple laparoscopic ventral hernia repair. Our experience at our institution at Malana Zad Medical College spans four years and 14 patients with a median follow-up of 30 months. The median area of defect in these patients was 80 square centimeters. Most of these patients were patients who had previous laparotomy for perforation peritonitis and anticipated dense adhesions. A few patients were previous midline scar uh, due to classical cesarean section. Uh, most of these patients um, were discharged uh, within four days of post-operative period and had a high satisfaction score of 9100. There were one complication which required mesh explantation at five months. However, we did not encounter any recurrence uh, till now. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Chairperson Sir, hybrid hernia repair is a technique which should be preferred in giant incisional hernias where laparoscopic approach would not be convenient or feasible. It allows combining the advantages of open and laparoscopic approaches, thereby helping in safe visualizers, avoiding the section of large flaps and placing a laparoscopic mesh. It offers good results in complicated and difficult ventral hernias. Large studies and longer follow-up is required to generate further data on this promising technique. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Anubhav. 
uh, it was a very well studied talk and definitely it has put forth some very uh, time tested principles and backed by a lot of data in your talk so looking at the time constraints i think we can move on to our speaker dr ramana who i believe that he is ready with his presentation so with permission of all our panelists dr dave dr ramana could you take over yeah uh, i'm really sorry uh, i hope you can see my screen and let me know if the slides are moving yes they are yes oh, very well thank you so recurrence is grossly underestimated this is something which all hernia ex uh, experts would agree today now the question is why do these hernias tend to recur now the understanding of this subject has to start with the subject of mesh tissue integration or mti and if you look at this ct you can see that the forces of the intraabdominal uh, pressure are pushing outward against the defect and resultant is that the mesh gets torn out from its interface with the fascia now this leads progressively to bigger and bigger hernias now this is another example of the forces acting on the mesh at its interface with the rectus abdominis here you can see that and that leads to a disruption so this is something that happens at a single point where the strain on the mesh and the tissue interface is the maximum and that starts expanding <clears throat> now i bombs are the commonest mas ventral hernia surgeries now the common errors we don't really need to be labor these points this bad choice of patients then the technical flaws like you don't remove the fat or you don't fix it well enough or the, use a smaller mesh and these are things which all of us know and one of the important things is the mesh being a little off center so one side gets covered less but the important thing is can we have a strategy to reduce the recurrences after mvhr can we predict these recurrences so you would see that patients who have had bowel injuries or complications patients who have previous recurrences obese patients bridge repairs all these patients are liable to get recurrences so the question then is can we predict infectious complications now we have those patients who are obviously liable for infection and that is another important consideration now the question then is can we identify for a given patient the best minimal access ventral hernia procedure if then then we would be able to control the outcomes the outcomes depend on three factors the first and potentially most important factor is the surgeon then the patient and thirdly the hernia now there is data to suggest that the surgeon is an important etiologic factor the fact that the patient factors lead to complications is well described today in over hundreds of thousands of patients and there is data which says that the width of the hernia and contamination are the most telling factors impacting recurrence in ventral hernias now the outcomes they also depend on a fourth factor which is the mesh and this the hernia med studies have shown us i'll give you a couple of examples this is a mesh which was good at the time of implantation but over the years it has started becoming delaminated this is a mesh which was implanted somewhere and now has found its way into the bladder and this is a mesh which was implanted well but the surgeon missed a bowel injury and it led to a disaster and a huge complex hernia so these are just some examples and my belief is that most ipom recurrences can be prevented by five measures the number one is you choose the right patient and this is a list of those patients you should avoid like obvious ones loss of domain entrocutaneous fistulas the defect is located close to a bony orifice or a stoma a defect which is bigger than 10 cm so on and so forth the second thing is you must close all the defects now this is especially so in incisional hernia as dr bandarkar said these are not level 1 uh, rcts but there is multiple 
low level, lower level evidence, which is now compelling and has hugely influenced the practice that all ventral hernia surgeries should incorporate midline closure or defect closure. Okay, these are some of the studies which have shown that uh, data. The third point is use a very wide mesh. Now, why? Now, I show you this image from a computer representation of CT. The central area of the mesh is here. And on this side, you can see the area of instability, which is far wider than the area of the mesh. So what happens is the strain on the mesh tissue interface at the edges would be so much that they would give way at some point. So a bigger mesh, a wider mesh is very, very important in order to offset these strain forces. So this is why today we do not think in terms of the rule of five, which is just five centimeters overlap as the Hotter study uh, and also the studies by uh, Tullo and Andrew Debo, they have shown us that the five centimeter overlap leads to a significant amount of recurrence and the defect diameter and the mesh diameter, the mesh should be at least four times that. And if you have a large defect, it may be even more. Now, the fourth point is fixation. Now, all of us know that you must fix an intraperitoneal mesh. Now, a very recent uh, study published in March by Christian Holansky uh, is that it is an intensive IPOM plus. So it is more than IPOM. They use two and a half to four times the number of tags that one would ordinarily use. So using these tags, every two centimeters in all directions, not just along the edge, not just along the defect edges, but also along the entire surface of the mesh. So the mesh to tack ratio has to be less than four is to one. If it is more than five is to one, then the chances of recurrence is double. So this is a newer study. Of course, it's not an RCT. And the downside of more fixation obviously is more pain. Now, the last point is to avoid infectious complications, and that has been uh, talked about very well. The additional thing is avoid PTFE meshes, don't reuse disposables. And one of the most important things I would like to say, and it's not talked about often enough, is that enterotomy is a significant complication in laparoscopic IPOM repairs, and those are some of the most important causes for development of complications, mesh explantations, and recurrences. So if you can avoid infection, you can avoid recurrence. Now, the correlation between infection and recurrence in hernias is well established today. And we have the infection, uh, resurgery, reinfection, re-recurrence, vicious cycle. So this is the vicious cycle of hernia surgery. Now, this is an example of an IPOM, uneventful IPOM, which was done. And you can see that there is a, an abscess and the mesh is floating inside it. And it came out. We took this out laparoscopically. One side is polypropylene. The other side is PTFE. You can see the mesh edges have shrunk irregularly. That is because the PTFE doesn't shrink and the polypropylene shrinks. So it leads to a crenellated edge that invites adhesions. When we talk of complex AWR, the recurrences come from iatrogenic injuries to the linea alba or the linea semilunaris. It also comes from sterility breaks and those atypical mycobacterial infections in deep intermuscular spaces uh, with a mesh are extremely troublesome. And these are going to be the bane of uh, patients who are subjected to newer, minimally invasive AWR procedures. Uh, in centers where the port site infection rates uh, are not close to zero. So this is a significant issue. And the other reason for uh, a recurrence would be a missed hernia. Okay, yes, I'm done. Yeah. So that is as far as the uh, recurrences in complex AWR are concerned. Thank you very much. And I invite you to the ENZOR conference on 7th November. Thank you, Ramana, sir. And uh, again, there are no question and questions in the chat box. So over to the organizers for 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think uh, I must thank uh, everybody for maintaining the time. It's been a privilege listening to all the speakers who did a great job. I think the music was better than my voice. Please go ahead, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, no, I must thank the chairperson, Dr. Sandeep Dave, Dr. Shinde, Dr. Padma Kumar, and the speakers, Dr. Ramesh Agarwal, Dr. Deepraj Bandarkar, Dr. Ramana, and Dr. Anubhav Bindal. And with that, we.